Now we discuss the dogma of the Immaculate Conception as it is contained in Scripture and in tradition. And as we do this, my friends, keep in mind uh, our first couple lectures, which talked about the sources of divine revelation. We will not find an explicit reference to the Immaculate Conception in Scripture, nor do we need to, because it is indeed Scripture and tradition as interpreted by the Magisterium that, that makes up authentic divine revelation or Christian revelation uh, in the fullness of Catholic life and thought. So, we're going to go through the scriptural seeds of the Immaculate Conception. I want to focus on two scriptural seeds, uh, and these were the two accentuated in Ineffabilis Deus, the defining document of the Immaculate Conception, December 8th, 1854. The first is Genesis 3.15. We talked about this a little bit more generally in survey, but I, I want to focus uh, with a little bit more detail on the passage of Genesis 3.15. God addresses Satan under the appearance of the, serp, uh, the appearance of the serpent in the following words: quote, "I will put enmity between you and the woman, and your seed and her seed. She shall crush your head, and you shall lie in wait for her heel." Now we're going to talk about the pronoun controversy in a few moments. Is it she will crush your head or, or he will crush your head? We'll talk about the history of that uh, and, and as well uh, the New Volgate's uh, solution to that issue. But let's go back to the protagonist and the antagonist of the passage. God is talking to the serpent and the two major figures which emerge from the text is the woman and the serpent. God the Father puts enmity between the woman and the serpent and their respective seeds. Now, what is uh, enmity? Uh, the, the Hebrew word eba means a total and perpetual opposition. And so, this is a gift, a grace. An, a divine action from God the Father putting absolute and perpetual opposition between the woman who will give birth to the seed of victory. And every Christian must agree that seed of victory is Jesus Christ. Versus Satan, the serpent, and his seed. So, let's go through those four figures, if you will. The serpent is clearly Satan. What about the woman? Well, obviously, the woman initially is Eve before this verse, but then we get the great prophecy, the, 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 the prophecy of the Proto-Evangelium, uh, the first gospel. It's called the first gospel, even though it's a book of Genesis, because it speaks about the, the, the victory of the Savior. The woman must ultimately be Mary. And clearly, in Genesis 3.15, you're talking about a prophetic text, something that's going to be fulfilled in the future. Note, my friends, a, a very significant difference between the woman of Genesis 3.15 and the woman of Genesis 3.16. The woman of Genesis 3.15 is the mother of the seed of victory. The woman of Genesis 3.16 is the woman that receives punishment for disobeying God, a punishment that will include the elements of death and disease and pain and labor. And that's why good scriptural scholarship identifies that the woman of Genesis 3.15 is the woman of the future, the future mother of the Messiah, and then the narrative goes back to the present, to what's happening in the garden and the reason they're going to have to leave the garden. And that's why the woman of Genesis 3.15 simply must be Mary. And, and we could put this in a very simplified uh, kind of formulation. Only one woman gives birth to Jesus, and it's Mary. And if you rightly identify the seed that's going to participate in, in the conquering of Satan and his seed, uh, incidentally, what, what is the seed of Satan? 
The seed of Satan would be evil, all fallen angels, and all evil humans. And so the identical opposition, uh, if, if you were going to sketch this, it would be the woman and her seed over here, the serpent and his seed over there, and enmity in between. It's a parallel enmity that the woman has between the serpent and that Jesus has from sin. That means it's a complete, radical, perennial opposition. So, speaking very specifically to the Immaculate Conception, if you have, as something given by God, a complete opposition to not only Satan, but also his seed, then you have to be free from sin. Uh, as one author put it, Mary would not be a double agent. Mary's not going to participate with Jesus in the great work of redemption, and at the same time, she's going to do some side collaborating with the enemy, with Satan. God the Father is the one who ordained that Mary would be free from Satan, free from original sin, free from its effects. That's all on the other side. The side of Mary and the side of Jesus are both free from Satan and his evil influence. It is a very foundational uh, and legitimate basis for the Immaculate Conception. How, as G.K. Chesterton would say, you know, flip it on its head, how could Mary have a total and radical opposition from Satan and still cooperate with him? It can't go both ways. The Immaculate Conception. Now, what about the pronoun controversy? Uh, this is somewhat incidental to the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, but it's fair to hit it here. Which is it? Is it she will crush your head or is it he? Well, let's establish first and foremost that if it is she, as it has been translated for 15 centuries and used by many papal documents, she only crushes the head of Satan by the power of Jesus. So the theological foundation and, and, and really the certainty of the passage is that if it is Mary that's going to crush the head of Satan, she does so by the grace and power and total subordination and absolute dependence on Jesus Christ. Now, historically, St. Jerome translated this into the Vulgate. So, you're talking about Hebrew into Latin, and the pronoun is ipsa, I-P-S-A, ipsa. And for 15 centuries, it's ipsa. In the dogma definitional document of Blessed Pius IX, again, in Ephibulus Deus, in Ephibulus Deus, there is a paragraph des describing how Mary crushes Satan with her immaculate foot. Also later, paper, papal documents, Pius the Tenth, uh, Saint Pius the Tenth, Benedict the Fifteenth, Pius the Eleventh, Pius the Twelfth, they all use ipsa, all use she. Well, then what happens? Well, then uh, in more recent times, there was an effort to, uh, in fact, the Vatican had a new translation of the Vulgate called the New Vulgate in the mid-80s, and there was an effort to get back to the original languages. And so they went to the Hebrew. Now, in speaking to several biblical scholars, the Hebrew is difficult because the same pronoun can be used both for he and she uh, in different contexts. To add to further complication, evidently during different centuries, the same Hebrew word uh, would be used interchangeably for he and for she uh, in, in a way that would indicate that in this century, the word indicated he. In the next century, it seems like it was more used to indicate she. Uh, in talking to a good biblical scholar, he said the difference even between the he and she uh, as it's written in the Hebrew is just uh, the tiny iota length of one letter. Now, St. Jerome would certainly have more access to several uh, texts of the Hebrew Old Testament intact than we would today. And he was a genial translator. So he would know the difference between he and she. So the, the Hebrew would favor the he. In the New Vulgate, uh, the church opted for ipsum, I-P-S-U-M, which is actually neuter, uh, which doesn't really help the controversy too much. 
in that, or at least the, the, the discussion on it, in that it would be translated, it will crush your head. Now, as I mentioned before, the theology is clear. Anything Mary does, she does by the power of Jesus. But the strong tradition of she, uh, the fact that many Mariologists are going back to the she uh, even after the new Vulgate uh, has come out with it uh, being it, and even the dubiosity, the lack of clarity regarding the uh, Hebrew historically, uh, it's interesting to note, uh, not as a source of revelation, but just as a light on the subject, that when Our Lady starts appearing uh, during the present age of Mary, uh, the, this, this period of, of many and, and, and fruitful apparitions uh, approved by the Church. In 1830, she appears at Rudabach uh, with the miraculous mental apparitions, and the vision clearly has Mary with her foot on the head of Satan. Once again, am I saying that's divine revelation? No, I'm not. I'm saying that private revelation, though, sometimes can confirm that which was being articulated by popes of the 19th and 20th century, uh, as well as back all the way to the 5th century when St. Jerome makes the translation in terms of usage of she by the church. In any case, uh, if Mary's doing it, she does it by the power of Jesus. Now, the second major text, uh, before we leave this text, I do want to make the reference of, of the connection between the Immaculate Conception and co-redemption in this text. Notice how God the Father first places this enmity between Mary and Satan. Then he talks about Mary crushing the head of Satan. And what does that tell us? It tells us something that, that Cardinal Wojtyla, uh, the future St. John Paul II, would say in a, in a beautiful homily, December 8, uh, 1973, when he said in Krakow, remember that she is the co-redemptrix because she's first the Immaculate Conception. Once again, it's, it's God preparing Mary to work with Jesus, to, to redeem the world, always completely subordinate and, and, and independent, that this Immaculate Conception prepares for the task, for the mission, for the vocation, for the greatest one-two punch in all history, the Redeemer and the Co-Redemptrix. And so even that is prophesied in this text. The enmity prepares for the battle. And we'll see this as a cosmic battle, which, again, is the bookends of Scripture. The woman versus the serpent, Genesis 3.15, and the woman versus the dragon in Revelations 12. Now, the second scriptural passage for the Immaculate Conception is Luke 1.28. Hail, full of grace. Now, the Latin rendition is, is, is well done. The Latin rendition is, you know, Ave Gratia plena, it also indicates this, this plenitude of grace, but the Greek is sublime. And even though I would not necessarily encourage you to have to memorize a lot of Greek to defend and to articulate the truth about Mary, this is one, this is one Greek word you do want to make your own. And this is the Greek word ke keritomine, ke keritomine. And ke keritomine is a Perfect passive participle. Who cares? What does that mean? A perfect passive participle tells us that it is an action completed in the past. That's the perfect part, right? As we have in our in our English grammar, an active, uh, I mean, an action completed in the past. But in the Greek, the perfect passive participle has an influence, a, a relevance to the present. So it's not like ancient past, or completed back there and has nothing to do with up here. It's a completion of the past that is relevant to the present. That's the Greek perfect passive participle. And this verb in Greek, to uh, shari, to, to endow or to grace, is only used in this form, in this form, in one place in the entire New Testament, and it's here. So, we can talk about someone you know, receiving grace uh, only once in the New Testament is there reference to a person being perfected in grace. The, the great scripture scholar uh, Ignace de la Poterie, uh, the biblical in Rome, said the best, the most accurate way uh, this passage can be translated is, is to say, 
Hail or rejoice, either is fine. Hail, you who have been perfected in grace. Or, hail, you who have been completely transformed in grace. But please note, my friends, this is an action completed in the past with a relevance to today. In other words, you can't hold that the angel is saying, hail, full of grace, that is, hail, I'm gracing you now by coming to you, as it is oftentimes held by other Christian confessions. It doesn't make any sense in the Greek. It has to be, hail, you who have been perfected in grace as an action completed in the past, but oh, is this relevant to my invitation. That's the beauty of the passage. So in a, in a profound grammatical, etymological way, the Immaculate Conception is contained in this greeting by the angel. St. John Paul II would say that the angel gives Mary a new name. He calls her the full of grace. And St. Maximilian Kolbe would further develop this and say, not just a name, but something about her very being, that Mary is full of grace. She's the Immaculate Conception by her very nature. More on that in times to come. Now, let's go forward in a quick summation of the rich tradition concerning the Immaculate Conception. I want to deal with this tradition and its beautiful development in, in three stages. Excuse me. The first stage, the first four centuries, approximately the first three to four centuries. This is called the period of implicit belief in the Immaculate Conception. From approximately fourth to fifth century up through the 11th century, this is the stage of a more greater explicit belief in the Immaculate Conception. And then from the 11th century all the way through the 19th century, you begin to see formulations that very much resemble the final dogmatic proclamation of the Immaculate Conception. So let's go through this step by step. The first three centuries of Christianity refer to Mary as being identical to Eve before the fall of Eve. Now that's a remarkable statement because obviously before the fall of Eve, Eve has not participated in original sin uh, and Eve has not lost grace. These are the terms that, that the fathers of the church used about Mary, again, within these first three centuries, uh, not exclusively, but predominantly in the East, that Mary was purer than the angels, completely free of stain, which is what the word uh, immaculate means, uh, sine macula. Uh, even references of being uh, of great sanctity, all holy, all pure, purer than the angels, uh, all these superlatives, but even, and St. Uh, Saint Ambrose from the West will add this, uh, altogether without stain, altogether without stain. Now, that's uh, towards the end of the fourth century, but here, incidentally, you're talking about St. Ambrose, who is the theological father of St. Augustine, who certainly knew about original sin and its effects. So understand, uh, when they compare Mary to Eve before Eve's fall, they understand that this is pre-original sin. When they're using these expressions, all pure, all holy, pu more pure than the angels, all together without stain, that's the Immaculate Conception. Now, you might ask, well, why is it called the period of implicit belief then? Well, it's only called the period of implicit belief because they don't specify that it happens at conception. But others have argued, and I think rightly so, this is hardly to call it an implicit belief just because they haven't specified it's happening at conception because the biology of the time didn't understand that life began at conception. This is even a, a, a question or a doubt up through the, the, the 12th century. But they did hold that Mary, as she was created, was created without stain. Uh, and, and again, that's a rather remarkable element uh, when you're talking about this woman uh, who in the early church is still properly seen in, in, in great uh, uh, subordination 
in, 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 in the shadow of Jesus uh, as, it, as it's supposed to be, but still her presence is there. There's no question, there's no question that they're talking about the mother of Jesus who intercedes, as we, we talked about in the earlier lectures, and now who has a nature like the nature of Eve before the fall. Now, I want to give you some of the specific references of the fathers through this period. Uh, why? Because so often, my friends, so often there are references that this doctrine is invented in the 19th century, or if not that extreme, is something that uh, really only develops uh, through the medieval church and, and some of its excesses. Uh, it's simply not the case. Uh, this is something that is clear and taught, but as we talked about earlier, it is something that grows in the womb of the church. These doctrinal seeds are there. The awareness of the faithful are that she is what they say she is. She's, she's a, a all holy, all pure, etc., but we're going to have a greater understanding of it as this doctrinal seed grows in the womb of the church. Let me give you some examples of what the fathers uh, and doctors of the church are saying during this period. One uh, author who straddles that first period to this second period, the 5th to the 11th century period, is St. Ephraim, who dies in 370, uh, 373. Listen to the quote of St. Ephraim. He says, quote, These two innocent women, Mary and Eve, had been created utterly equal, but afterwards one became the cause of our death, the other the cause of our life. St. Ephraim would go on in this prayer to indicate, in this ad prayer address, addressed to Jesus, quote, Thou and thy mother are the only ones who are immune from all sin. This is 4th century Mariology. They got it. It was there. Growth, absolutely. Greater understanding, clearly. But they had the heart of the Immaculate Conception from the beginning. Now, in this, I'm going to give you some examples, again, in, in this 5th through 11th century period, so you can see the development. Severus, for example, who is the Bishop of Antioch, he dies in 538. He is the first to call Our Lady Immaculate. He said, She formed part of the human race and was the same essence as we, although she was pure from all taint and immaculate. That's 6th century. The next century, St. Sophronius, the uh, patriarch of Jerusalem, would be of the first to talk about Mary's pre-purification. He says, quote, You, Mary, have found the grace which no one has received. No one has been pre-purified besides you. So again, even though the, bio the biology of the time isn't so clear about life beginning conception, these church minds and hearts are identifying that this is happening uh, in a pre-birth uh, form formula uh, unique to Our Lady. St. Andrew of Crete uh, in the 8th century refers to Mary as, quote, the entirely immaculate virgin. We have the Eastern writer Theognostes, uh, in the 9th century, who is arguably the first to talk about Mary being immaculate from conception. But now we're only talking about the 9th century. He says, and I quote, It was indeed fitting that she who from the beginning had been conceived by a sanctifying action should also have a holy end. So, here it is, 9th century. Combining this, you've got an an amazing articulation of the Immaculate Conception, and we're still in the first millennium. Now, the third period, briefly, from the 11th century to the time of the definition in the 19th century. While in the East you have a continued beautiful development of this, you have in the West the controversies, the, the questions and doubts about the Immaculate Conception coming forward from two principal figures. Number one, St. Bernard of Clairvaux. Number two, St. Thomas Aquinas. And we're going to talk about this in the next lecture and, and draw out what their difficulties were. And I'm going to say once again, not because they found Mary to be unworthy, but because they found it to be incongruous with another held position at the time. 
but we're going to see, as history would show, those other held positions were in error. So they were trying to be consistent. Uh, in terms of the magisterium, it's at the 15th century where you get the first magisterial confirmation of this doctrine in the approval of the, uh, the liturgy and the, the mass and office of the Immaculate Conception. This is by uh, Pope Sixtus IV in 1477. Every pope from Sixtus IV until Pius IX uh, either maintained that which their predecessors held or they contributed to the development of the dogma in such ways that it led to a, a, an even greater clarity of the truth. So we're going to pause here, and in the next lecture, I want to go to the actual proclamation by Pius IX, so some of the historical preparations for the dogma, and then go back to the principal uh, controversies, uh, the principal objections to the Immaculate Conception, and why not only the definition, but some very helpful theology by Blessed Duns, John Dunn Scotus makes clear that this indeed is a truth immediately revealed by God as it is professed as such by Blessed Pius IX. Thank you.